Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. I'm coming to you again from Aoyama Park next to Tokyo National Art Center in the middle of Tokyo. Uh, it's a very nice day today. Uh, the Golden Week ended yesterday and a lot of people would normally be returning to school and work today but for obvious reasons uh, today seems like another holiday. Really quiet here in the city. Uh, May is a really nice time of year in Japan, the nicest time of year, if you ever plan on visiting the country. I don't recommend coming during Golden Week because you'll never find a hotel here during that season. But any other time of May is a really good time to come. Uh, the weather is nice and pleasant. Uh, we don't have any of the unpredictable weather we have like in April where it can be hot one day and snow the next. And uh, the rainy season hasn't started. Uh, June brings us the rainy season, so May is quite nice. And also we don't have to deal with the humidity which uh, hits us hard in the summertime. Uh, yeah, May is just a wonderful time to be here. Uh, during the Golden Week we didn't do very much. We spent most of the time at home for the obvious reasons. But uh, uh, it was, it's been quite hard for the last uh, uh, couple of weeks being at home, everyone together. Normally my wife works in the office, I work from a home office, and my daughter is in school, but for the last, uh, uh, since uh, March, we've all been in the house together. And uh, sometimes it's, it gets a little bit difficult, everyone being together, trying to do the things they need to do, uh, all in the same place. So last Sunday we piled into the car and we drove out of the city and headed up to Chiba to visit the seaside. Uh, it was a nice drive up there. Uh, it seems everyone decided to stay home for Golden Week, so there was no traffic at all on the highway. Uh, it took me an only an hour to get up there, where it usually takes me between two and a half and three hours. Uh, so it was really wonderful to be able to drive up in light traffic and get to the seaside quickly. Uh, the seaside was quite beautiful and warm and pleasant and not windy and it wasn't crowded. Uh, we enjoyed walking around the rocks and the sand and the ocean and going to the flower market and all of that. Uh, this is a wonderful place to come to if you come to Japan, but uh, uh, it's difficult to get to unless you have a, access to a car. Uh, it's not really difficult to drive the highways or get around in Japan if you're used to driving on the left-hand side of the road. Uh, you can't really take a train to a lot of the seaside locations in Chiba. Uh, there are no, no, there are few, or if any, I, I, I didn't really see any uh, train stations while I was there. But you can usually get the bus service uh, to the seaside, either from Tokyo Station or from uh, uh, train stations in the Chiba area. So, uh, yeah, a really great place. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back to uh, the subject of today's video. And instead of talking about a vintage Japanese camera today, I'm going to be talking about a vintage Japanese lens. Uh, in this case, it is the wonderful Nikon Nikkur 300, excuse me, 50 to 300 ED lens. Uh, when I first got into photography, I really lusted after one of these lenses. It was one of the best lenses which Nikon uh, made at the time, and it was also one of the most expensive. Uh, these lenses were made in the late 70s and sold through the early 80s, and they were quite expensive. Uh, back in those days, they listed for $3,500, which in 2020, $3,500 would be a hell of a lot of money for a lens. But back in 1980, $3,500 was a hell of a lot more money. And there was no way I could possibly afford to, to pay for one of these. So uh, it was just one of those things, one of many things I lusted after in magazines in those days, but could never uh, actually have. Uh, it wasn't until I came to Japan and began visiting the camera shops that I began to see these for uh, a reasonable price. And uh, they, they vary from very cheap to very expensive, depending on the condition they are in. When I say expensive, I mean an expensive one sells for about $700 here. A cheap one sells for about $150. Uh, the cheap ones tend to need a lot of work. Uh, unfortunately, these are quite prone to getting fungus uh, in the climate here in Japan, so you have to be careful to get the fungus-free example. And other ones tend to accumulate dust on the inside. I paid about $250 for this lens, and mainly because it had some dust on the inside, and the focus helicoid was just a little bit rough. It was smooth enough, but you know, you, you, it wasn't as smooth as it should have been. So uh, I got this lens and I was quite happy with it. 
Uh, I decided to take this lens and my uh, Nikkor 28-70 2.8D lens to Nikon's service center in Shinjuku to get them overhauled. I arrived there with my camera bag and first I took out my 28-70 to and handed it to the tech and he looked at it and without even touching it he knew that it had you know, a bad uh, silent wave motor because that's most of them have some kind of problem with the motor. So he looked at it for 30 seconds and put it in the tray and had me fill out the documents and then uh, I pulled this one out of the bag and showed it to him and his eyes lit up. It's like showing uh, an American guy uh, a handgun or something like that. It's just one of, you know, he was, he was very, very uh, interested in it. And so he took a look at it for several minutes and uh, checked it out for me and then told me that uh, this lens, the, the 50 to 300 uh, ED lens was the lens which uh, Nikon regards as the finest manual focus lens they ever made. And I was, maybe I was a little bit surprised to hear that because I know they've made some really wonderful lenses over the years. But uh, when I remember how much the, these things cost back when they were made, uh, then I, I could more believe what he was saying. Uh, unfortunately, though they were quite able to fix my uh, my uh, 28 to 70 uh, D in the core lens, they were unable to work on this one. They don't work on the manual focus zoom lenses anymore. So they sent me out to Kito's camera in Shinagawa and Kitos is a Nikon authorized uh, repair center and they were quite happy to work on this lens to clean out the dust and clean up the focus helicoid and give it to me you know, in like new condition. Uh, while I was there I found out that they worked on old rangefinder cameras by Nikon so I went home and I picked up my old Nikon SP which had a blacked out viewfinder where the uh, uh, I guess reflective material between the prisms became deteriorated and it couldn't really be used anymore. I didn't have much hope for ever getting the camera fixed because parts are, are quite hard to find for it, but I brought it in there and they said no problem, we can fix it. So they separated the prism, replaced the reflective coating, put it back together and gave it back to me and wow, I, I was quite amazed. Uh, and a superb job and they did quite a, a good job for a reasonable price on it. So. If you're ever in Japan with one of your old Nikon cameras which needs to be fixed, I recommend Kito's camera repair in Shinagawa. So let's go ahead and take a look at, the, at this lens. Uh, the Nikon 50-300, uh, the original version, was uh, introduced in the early to mid-1960s and was quite a popular lens and quite a good performer. Uh, uh, a lot of people enjoyed using the lens, but it uh, suffered from a problem which uh, glass or early glass lenses uh, you know, frequently came across in those days and that was uh, what they call chromatic aberration. And what that means is that the glass was uh, unable to focus all the colors on the exact same plane with much precision. Kind of like holding a prism in the sunlight and you can see how the prism divides the uh, light into different colors. Uh, lenses, uh, telephoto lenses with large apertures tend to do this when you uh, when you uh, focus them on film or on a digital sensor. So uh, by closing up the aperture a little bit it reduces the chromatic aberration but then the lens loses speed. So in order to keep the large apertures they began changing the formulas in the glass and the first things they did were uh, using uh, what they call rare earth or uh, thorium glass which you find in early fast lenses like the uh, old uh, Pentax Takumar 50 f1.4 or the, the Canon 35 uh, f2 or early Olympus uh, 55 mm f2. Uh, the, the coatings and the thorium glass in these lenses reduce the chromatic aberration. Uh, later on, uh, uh, better glass was uh, introduced, mainly uh, made from fluorite glass. Uh, the ED on the lens stands for extra low dispersion. So there's less dispersion of the light through the lens and less chromatic aberration. Uh, the fluorite crystals are not things which are mined out of the ground. They are grown in laboratories. And I guess the process of growing them is uh, rather expensive. So it added to the price of the lenses made from this material. Uh, I like this lens because despite its size and its weight, it gives me prime lens performance regardless of what setting I have. It, it shoots as, uh, as nicely at 50mm as a 50mm prime and it shoots as nicely at 100 or 250 or 300mm as prime lenses in those focal lengths. It's really amazing. 
Uh, there are some downsides to this. The first is the size and weight. This is not a lightweight lens. And also it's full manual operation. It takes a little bit of getting used to for those people who are used to uh, autofocus or auto everything. Uh, that said, it is quite uh, quick to use once you get used to it. Uh, sports photographers were uh, able to get really uh, precision focused uh, photos of sports action with these lenses. So if they're able to get a uh, good uh, performance from one of these lenses, an ordinary photographer should be able to do quite well with just ordinary photography. Uh, one interesting thing about these lens, which is different from the other ED lens, it's not an internal focus lens. You can see the barrel moving in and out as I focus. However, uh, the zoom barrel is internal. So uh, keep this in mind. And also, uh, another thing about this lens is uh, it, it's not as fast as the other ED lenses. It stops down to only uh, f4.5, uh, which makes it really a, a great performer on sunny or bright days. But uh, if you're going to be shooting it uh, like right now where the light is getting quite low as the sun is going down, you really should be using it on a tripod unless you're using a uh, much faster film. I was shooting this earlier today on my D800 at ISO, uh, the setting at 200 and f4.5 and shooting under the leaves toward the pond. I was able to take a few shots and uh, shutter speeds were down to about 1 30th or so of a second. So I had to pick up the, uh, the ISO speed to get the uh, shutter speed up higher enough to where I didn't have to worry about getting things blurry. I like to use this lens when I go on vacations. Um, we usually go to Hawaii uh, when we travel because uh, the distance isn't so great on the plane and if you have small children you don't want to spend a lot of time uh, in an airliner. So for the beaches and sunsets and things like that this is quite a wonderful lens. I really love it for that. Uh, it, uh, it, it has a tripod mount on the bottom and I recommend using the tripod mount whenever you do it because it is really heavy and it can put a lot of strain on the uh, on the lens mount flange. I've never actually damaged uh, a lens mount on a camera before, uh, even you know dropping or whatever, but still it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, on the collar here, which supports the lens and the tripod, we, we have a couple of strap lugs. And I don't usually use these when I'm uh, using the F3 with uh, MD4 on it. I just either hold the camera or uh, I don't mind using a regular uh, strap because when I'm carrying the camera, it's hanging vertically anyway. The lens is pointing straight down. I do find it uh, a little easier to use these on when I'm using a smaller body, like a Nikon FE or FM or something like that. On this side here we have a knob which uh, you turn out and this allows you to switch the camera uh, from portraits to, uh, uh, I guess, panoramic modes. And there are detents built in to, to uh, kind of lock the camera or coax it into staying in the correct position. And then you thread this in to, to lock it in the right place. Uh, this has this lens is the ordinary uh, Nikon F mount with the AIS ring here, so it will work on pretty much any Nikon camera uh, uh, produced uh, from the 1950s until today. Uh, I like using this lens on uh, this particular camera, uh, my old F3P, but I, I've used it a lot on a D7 and D800, and it works perfectly well. Uh, when you're using these lenses on a later uh, a digital SLR, you have to make sure to set the lens manually inside the menus. Um, I just set it for a 50 millimeter with aperture f4.5 and it works quite well. Uh, this is really an amazing lens. I, I really recommend it to someone who is looking for a good all-around lens if they don't mind the weight so much. Uh, talking about the weight, it's, it is quite heavy, but I, I would say it's not really much heavier than like a, a, a 70 to 200 uh, fast uh, uh, AF zoom, which, uh, which a lot of uh, you know, people tend to carry around on their DSLRs. Uh, the manual operation takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you get it done, you know, get it down, uh, it's really simple. Uh, this lens is getting a little bit uh, popular with cinematographers. Uh, it, it's really excellent for cinematography. That's kind of something I've been looking at recently and uh, thinking of uh, trying out. So I'm probably going to hook this thing up to my uh, D800 and go out and attempt to shoot a little bit of video with it and see how it does. Uh, hopefully I get some good results. But anyway, uh, that's it for my... Uh, uh, review or I guess my description of the Nikon uh, 50 to 300 ED. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more videos about Japanese vintage uh, cameras, lenses, or photography, uh, please subscribe. If you have any questions about this lens or anything else, feel free to ask in the comments section below. 
Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again soon.